Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the FE and VET web support webinar for the new Turing scheme. Um, today, uh, we're going to do an overview of this sector of the programme. So we're going to look at some of the key areas, uh, eligibility criteria, the application form, and we're also going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, with me today, well, I'll introduce myself first, sorry. Uh, I'm Daniel King and I'm a senior project manager at uh, the delivery partner for the Turing scheme. Uh, joining me today is Olivia Nola. Okay. Uh, Michael Truman. And then Richard Jarrett. Great. So thanks to everyone for attending and I'm sure some of you are very keen to find out about the new programme. Um, so we're just going to highlight, as I said, all the key areas, um, the basics of the programme and we'll provide a framework of how to put together your application. Um, and as mentioned, Olivia will provide um, sort of a first look overview of the application form itself. Uh, and just a note on that, it is a brief overview of the application form today, but we are recording a webinar uh, on Thursday, which is then scheduled to get released on our YouTube channel on Friday. Uh, and like that, this webinar today is also being recorded and it will also be released on our YouTube channel afterwards, so you can refer back to it whenever you want. So I'm now going to start uh, a presentation for everybody to view. So I'll just share that. Right. So I'll get straight into it then. So we'll begin by looking at the eligibility criteria for organisations applying for funding. An FA and VET study and traineeship mobility project must comprise of one or more of the following organisations. Uh, an FE college or school active in the field of FE or VET. Um, a local or regional public authority coordination body or other organisations with a role in the field of FE and VET. A company or public or private organisation hosting training or otherwise working with learners or apprentices. And finally, a company, public or private, applying on behalf of a mobility consortium. Um, important thing to note is that individuals cannot apply directly for a grant uh, and all applications must be submitted by an organisation. An individual organisation is only allowed to submit one application per sector. However, additional applications are allowed when they are submitted as a mobility consortium. However, an individual mobility consortium is only allowed to submit one application. So just to go over what constitutes a mobility consortium, under FE and VET you're able to submit an application as a consortium, which is where you work in partnership with at least one other organisation to deliver a project. They are particularly useful setups when your own organisation doesn't have direct access to participants or if you're coordinating a regional body of organisations. The rules for consortiums are that they must include at least one college or school um, and they can also include organisations that pr provide administrative support to other members of a consortium. And the role and obligations of supporting administrative organisations must be formally defined within the application form. Um, finally, for organisations, just go over the receiving organisations. So, First things first, there are no restrictions on the country in which mobility can take place. Um, every country in the world is an eligible destination under the Turing scheme. However, um, the FCDO travel advice must be adhered to. For example, if their advice is do not travel to a country, the delivery partner wouldn't fund a project to that country. Um, it is the responsibility of the applicant to assure this guidance is being adhered to. So in terms of the nature of receiving organisations, they can be any public or private organisation active in the field of further education or vocational education and training, or any organisation involved in the labour market. Um, 
full lists of the types of ele uh, eligible organisation can be found in the Turing Scheme Programme Guide, uh, which is now available on our website, and we will be posting a link to this shortly. So now I'll move on to the eligibility for participants. So within your project, you can include people who fall into these following categories. Learners and recognised UK FE or VET courses or apprentices. Persons accompanying learners abroad for safeguarding reasons. Recent graduates of FE or VET courses. And those not in permanent education or training uh, who may be retraining or upskilling but only if their training is taking place through schools or colleges or through government funded training. For individual projects, there are no minimum or maximum age limits imposed on participants. Um, for, particip for participants under the age of 18, appropriate safeguarding rules must be adhered to. There is no limit on accompanying persons. However, their inclusion must be justified within the application narrative. There is no minimum or maximum number of participants uh, per project and learners do not need to be UK nationals to be eligible for the scheme. They just need to be within those eligible categories. Again, uh, a full list of the eligibility criteria can be found in the programme guide. Next up on eligibility are activities. So, an important rule for this round of the Turing scheme is that all activities must take place within the 2021-2022 academic year, which is from 1st of September 2021 to 31st of August 2022. Under FE and VET sector of funding, there are three types of activity. These are studies mobility, which are more classroom based activities, then traineeship mobilities, which are workplace based activities. And finally, there are skills competitions, which are formally organised competitive vocational skills competitions, um, which have to be run by a third party organisation. For activity duration, study and traineeship mobilities must last between 14 and 365 days, so a year. Um, please note 14 day duration is expected to cover travel days and weekends, meaning. Um, sorry, yeah. The uh, participants are expected to have a break rather than working solidly for 14 days. Activities that include participants who have special educational needs or disabilities can have a minimum duration of five days. Um, this would need to be sufficiently justified within the application form and this rule is in place to help facilitate the access to the programme for people from these backgrounds. Activities which take place outside of Europe must have a minimum duration of 15 days and this is in order to account for the greater distance travelled. Skills competitions and activities have a duration between one day and 10 days. Um, all of these activities can include accompanying persons, but as mentioned before, they can only be included for safeguarding reasons and this would need to be justified within the application narrative. So moving on from eligibility, we'll now go over the grant rates. So we'll, we'll go through them in order of appearance in the programme guide and we'll be giving a good overview of them, but the detail in its entirety can be found written down in the programme guide, which obviously I've mentioned a lot, but it is the best source of information for anything related to the Turing scheme. So organisations with successful applications will receive funding towards delivering placements. This would include providing participants with grants to help cover travel expenses and cost of living, and then administrative funding for delivering the projects. I'll now go through these budget categories. Starting off is organisational support. This covers all costs directly linked to the delivery of the project. It can cover costs for things such as preparation of participants, for support and monitoring of participants during placements, 
and dissemination of project results after completion of placements. Organisational support is paid at a flat rate uh, in its fixed total par per participant at £315 per participant for the first 100 in the project and then £180 after the 101st participant in the project. The next budget category is travel costs. So this is funding used to pay for the travel of participants to the project activities. Funding is awarded at a fixed rate per participant, dependent on the distance between the sending and hosting organisation. There are eight distance bands which have different levels of funding, ranging from £20 to £1,360. The full list of the bands can be found in the programme guide. Uh, the distance between organisations should be calculated using Google Maps, which has a distance calculating tool, and it should cover a one way direct trip, not a return journey. Also point that's a straight line journey, which is how the tool operates. In cases where travel is particularly expensive and the grant rate doesn't cover the total, there is an option to claim additional funding. Within the application narrative, you must demonstrate that the grant awarded in the distance span doesn't cover at least 70% of the actual costs. Where this is demonstrated, you can then receive 80% of the actual costs. Um, this is likely to occur when you're travelling from remote destinations or to remote destinations, um, for example, in the islands in Scotland or outlying regions of away from main transport hubs. Um, or if you have to then pay for additional onward transport when you get into the destination, such as ferries. OK, so next up is linguistic support. This funding is available to support to support participants to prepare for working and studying in a different language environment. It can cover things such as lessons or courses in a chosen language. It is only available for activities that are longer than 19 days in duration. Uh, it cannot be claimed when English will be the working language. Um, when you're running a project that is in a predominantly English speaking country, um, it would help the assessment process to clarify that English won't be the working language. For example, if you're in the west of Ireland and it would be a Gaelic speaking uh, environment or if you went to Quebec in Canada where it'd be a French speaking environment. The next budget category is cost of living. So this budget category is for funding any costs relating to the subsistence of participants, for example accommodation and meals. The amount of funding awarded is dependent on which group a country falls into. There are three groups and are based on the cost of living within that country, um, which the highest cost of living being in group one and the lowest being in group three. You will receive a fixed total per day based on what group the destination country falls into. After the 14th day of activity, the funding total is reduced. The full list of countries and which group they fall into can be found on the Dream Scheme website and in Annex B of the programme guide. Um, just to go over those rates, in Group 1, participants receive £109 for the first 14 days and then £76 per day after. In Group 2, it's £94 per day for the first 14 and then £66 after. And in Group 3, it's £80 per day for the first 14 and then £56 per day afterwards. The final two budget categories are in place, to, uh, which are additional support for disadvantaged backgrounds and additional support for special educational needs, are in place to ensure the scheme is inclusive to people from all backgrounds and prevent any barriers to people's participation. Um, first, these additional support for participants from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, this is also referred to as exceptional costs, and these are additional funds available for participants who fall into the disadvantaged category defined in Annex A of the programme guide. 
Um, for reference, this includes students with an annual household income of £25,000 or less, students receiving universal credit or income related benefits, learners in care or, or who, have, who are, excuse me, who are care experienced, uh, students who have caring responsibilities, learners in receipt of free meals and refugees and asylum seekers. Exceptional costs can cover any additional expense incurred to support participation of disadvantaged participants, such as passports, visas, insurance, appropriate clothing. Um, this funding is paid at an actual cost rate. So when you request it in your application form, um, please provide the exact figure of the expense that you need. So there is the list in Annex A of people defined as disadvantaged. However, um, if participants in your project do not fall into these categories, but you feel that there is sufficient need for this funding, you are still able to request it, but you must provide a strong case uh, in the application narrative in order for it to be approved. Um, finally, we have additional support for special educational needs and disabilities um, being referred to as SEND. So SEND support is the budget for supporting participants who fall into these categories. Um, there is a breakdown in the programme guide but it's essentially anybody who has any special educational needs. Um, it doesn't need to be defined explicitly in the application form. Um, eligible costs are 100% funded, and these can cover things such as medical and care needs, specialised transport and equipment, and they can also fund preparatory visits, um, which are entirely funded under this budget category. Uh, the rules for these visits are just that they can be three days in total and they're also allowed to include both learners and staff. Um, when these are applied for, um, an assessment will be made by the delivery partner as to the um, balance of funding requested versus the need of the project. So we can't have a, a very large quantity of people going on these. It should be around one staff, one learner or two staff members around that area. So that covers the basics of um, the new programme and we're now going to move on to the applications. So as mentioned before, we'll be doing an in-depth run through of the application forms and Olivia will also be doing a brief demonstration today. So in those uh, segments and the other webinar, we'll be going into more depth on the qualitative side of the new application forms. So uh, on the screen at the moment, can you see a brief overview of the process? So all application forms must be submitted online. This is via the British Council's application portal. Uh, links to which are currently on the Turing Scheme website. Uh, the application is launched on the 12th of March and the deadline for FE and VET is 7th of May, which provides an eight week application window. Full application guidance which provides a step by step guide to completing the form and additional information on the qualitative questions is available on our website as well. And as I mentioned, the other webinar will be released on Friday. So that'll be on our YouTube channel, but it will also be uh, included in our newsletter as well. Um, following on from that recorded webinar, we will also be running two further application support workshops in April. Um, the dates are still TBC, but announcements will be made when they're finalised and you'll be able to sign up for those. Um, these workshops should provide will, will provide an opportunity for you to ask us at the delivery partner direct questions about any issues you have with the application form or its content or any queries about eligibility, funding, anything like that. So yeah, it'd be watch out for that, those announcements and do sign up if you have any additional queries after our first batch of support webinars. So the application award process, after submission, all applications will be checked to see if, if sector eligibility criteria are respected. 
Following this, financial capacity checks will be conducted on your organisation. Um, financial capacity means that an applicant has stable and sufficient sources of funding to maintain activity throughout the period during which the project is being carried out. Parts of this check will involve uh, involve a review of an applicant's financial accounts, regardless of requested grants, checks on companies' house, and also credit bureau checks. So when we move on to assessing the applications themselves, assessors, which are external to the delivery partners, will conduct the qualitative and budget checks upon your application. And these will be scored out of 100 based on the assessment criteria found within the programme guide. At the end of the assessment process, a project assessment board comprising of representatives from the DfE and the devolved administrations will review a recommended list of projects to be funded per sector based on application assessment scores awarded by the assessors. And the application results uh, will be issued to applicants for all sector, uh, excuse me, issued to all applicants from each sector via email, uh, expecting to be in July 2021. So for successful applicants, uh, you'll then enter into the contract with the delivery partners. Um, this process will be conducted entirely online and it will be completed all before the project start dates in September. Um, more details of this process will be published at a later date. So just going to go over payments briefly now. So payments will be made to beneficiaries at the anticipated points of expenditure. These are defined as the points when the beneficiary needs to spend funding, for example, to pay staff or provide funding to participants. Beneficiaries will be asked to set out their anticipated points of expenditure as part of the application process, and this will, include, uh, will be included in the project plan, which is formed in the application form. Beneficiaries will receive one payment of organisational support funding before the mobility activities are due to take place based on the anticipated point of expenditure declared. Um, this can be up to six months before the first project activity is due to take place. Uh, so it can range from one month to six months. Organisational support is paid at project level with 80% of total funding paid. Uh, during the project and then 20% paid at the reporting stage. So other uh, budget categories, so everything excluding organisational support, uh, have their own anticipated point of expenditure and these can be one to three months before each activity is due to begin. So these points of expenditure are entered into your so you enter them for each activity of your project and then they um, form your project plan uh, which is created through the uh, collation of information entered by you on the application form um, this forms the starting point for the payments to be made uh, to you by the delivery partner um, the project plan summarizes mobility start dates uh, the anticipated points of expenditure and when requests will need to be submitted for payments to be made. Payment requests during the project life cycle will be made within the British Council's grant management tool. This tool uh, will be the project interface for successful applicants and has a live reporting function where you can request payments. More information on this tool and the payment process will be provided at a later date to successful applicants. At the end of a project, a final payment of up to 20% of eligible project costs or recovery requests will be made when the full project expenditure is reported and reconciled against live reporting data and project plan at final report stage. The aim of this approach is to ensure that beneficiaries are not paid before the point when funds are needed in line with government managing public money guidance, whilst also ensuring that payments made are an accurate reflection of the project activities. So, 
sorry. So, just go over reporting quickly. So, information about the participants and the nature, destination, and duration of their mobility will be gathered through the application by the delivery partner. Further information regarding additional costs for individual participants, for example, those with disabilities, will also need to be provided by beneficiaries to determine the grant level. Please be aware information about participants, such as those outlined above, will also be used by the delivery partner to monitor the progress in implementing the Turing scheme overall and whether it is meeting its objectives. A final report will be submitted within one month of the final completed mobility placement and include the details of all participants, including the destination and duration of their placements. The purpose of the final report is to provide a final complete picture of activities delivered and expenditure incurred and enable a budget reconciliation. Beneficiaries must also submit a, a certificate of expenditure or equivalent with their final report. Beneficiaries will also be required to gather reports from all the participants sent from placements during the project and must submit these to the delivery partner if requested. The final report will include a declaration from beneficiaries that project activities were delivered in line with the objectives set out in their original application for funding or approved changes during the project life cycle. As part of the final reporting requirements, beneficiaries in receipt of grants in excess of £40,000 will be required to provide independent and external assurance of grant funding uh, has been dispersed in accordance with the grant funding agreement. Costs should be minimised wherever possible, for example, including the assurance as an additional requirement to the annual audit. Costs associated in providing this assurance will be authorised as eligible expenditure. The certificate of expenditure, which must be signed by a qualified accountant, should be taken into account when formulating the project budget. The applicant will be required to complete a self-declaration checklist covering due diligence of their financial procedures and controls. So all of this information that I've just gone through is written down in the programme guide if you need to revisit it as well, because obviously that was quite a lot of narration. So that covers the ins and outs of the Turing scheme for FE and VET as an initial view for everyone here. Um, we will be going into more detail on the application form doing more support webinars, but first we're going to have our first view of the application form. So I'll hand over to my colleague Olivia who will provide the walkthrough and um, yeah, just be aware that the more detailed version will be released on Friday. Hi guys. Hi guys. So my, hey, name, my is name is Olivia. Olivia. I work for the FE and VET side of the Turing scheme. And as Dan said, I'm going to just briefly go over the new application form with you and um, the Q&A function at the top of your screen is in use at the moment, so do type away any questions you may have and my colleagues will try and get through them uh, throughout the presentation. OK, so. Sorry, that's not working. There we go. First things first is to familiarise yourself with the programme guide and make sure your organisation, participants and activities are eligible for the type of funding you're applying for. When you're sure your project meets the criteria, you need to register to the application portal and then log on. Upon opening the application, you'll be taken to an introduction page which gives you an overview of the form which you need to read. You're also given a unique application ID linked to the project at the bottom of the page which you need to keep safe. I've given you an example of this on the slide. You'll notice that there are a number of buttons at the top and bottom of each section which you can see on my screen now. They're for use throughout the application. Please note that the form automatically saves as you go along, so if you forget to click save after completing a section, then don't panic too much. Um, the next section is called sharing the application, which gives you the opportunity to share the form with other organisations in your partnership. Moving on is the project overview page, which you can see here. As you can see on the slide, there are subheadings under each section which you can expand, such as guidance on types of funding streams. A drop down will appear and provide you with more information. 
These buttons appear throughout the form and would recommend using them if you get stuck on a question or tick box. First of all, you'll need to choose which sector you're applying to. And in this case, it will be further education and vocational education and training. Now you'll need to enter your project title. All projects will start on the 1st of September 2021 and end on the 31st of August 2022. Further down this section are the project themes, which are just here as a reminder of what your project should be focusing on. Um, and you should include uh, references to these throughout the application. At the end of this section is the project summary text box, where you must provide a clear summary of your project, including its context, objectives, participant profile, activities and longer term benefits. There is a 500 word limit for this section, as there is with all of the text boxes which appear in this application form. When you finish with this section, either click on save and continue or choose the next section from the left hand side. And that goes with each section throughout the form. Moving on to organisation details. In this section, you'll provide further detail on your organisation and project contact persons. Firstly, select which type your organisation falls under, then enter your organisation name and address, as well as the registration number where applicable. It then asks for contact details of the first point of contact for your application and then your legal representatives details. This will be the person who is authorised to enter into a legally binding commitment on behalf of your organisation. If you're submitting this application on behalf of a national mobility consortium, click yes when asked and click yes when asked if your project has a partner organisation and this comes at the bottom of the page. Now move on to the narrative aspects of the application form and first up is positive impact. This section will cover driving positive impact and value for money. You should address these themes as part of your answers. You're asked a number of questions in this section which relate to areas such as the project's aims and objectives, impact on participants, learning outcomes and how the project provides good value for money. As with each section of the form, all questions must be answered in full and provide an adequate amount of detail for the assessor. Now let's go to international engagement, where you're asked about the international scope of your organisation, your partnerships, choice of destination and host, and partnership responsibilities. You should demonstrate the quality or potential of your partnership and its commitment to strengthening UK international relations. At the end of this section are two questions on reciprocal partnerships and sustained partnerships, which require a yes or no answer. We'll now move on to design of project plan. This section will cover the design of your project plan and the implementation and monitoring of activities. Questions will touch on areas such as logistical and practical arrangements of the project, monitoring, preparation of participants and receipt of feedback. You should provide a justification for any decisions made as part of your project plan. Activities should be clearly defined, comprehensive and realistic. Next is um, the widening participation section, which is about how your project supports social mobility. You'll be asked about how the project reaches those with fewer opportunities, how you'll promote it to such learners and how you'll support them. You should aim to explain how you'll ensure that learners from all backgrounds can participate and benefit from the scheme. Remember that one of the key themes of the programme is levelling up and will be something which the assessor will be looking for in your application's answers. This next section, Project Activities, gives you the opportunity to provide a detailed description of your project activities. The information you include in this section will automatically generate the project plan and will provide you with a schedule for your project, including points for requesting payments and your activity start and end dates. Select the number of months that you'll have mobility starting in. This will then be your number of activities. Within each activity, you'll be able to provide details on the mobilities that will start that month where the learners will go, how long they'll be abroad for, and any additional costs that you'd like to apply for. This guidance uses the example of one selected activity only, therefore a section on activity one 
only has been created for completion on the left hand side. If you select more than one mobility activity, the corresponding number of activity sections will be created on the left for completion. Activity one has now generated and you need to select the month and year your activity will start. There is then a section on the point of expenditure where you indicate how far in advance you'll need to receive funding prior to each month in which you have an activity starting. Next is the summary, which should outline the one activity. The summary will be assessed based on the likely impact of the activity um, will have will provide for participants and its value for money. After the summary is the cost of living request which are expenses directly linked to the subsistence of participants during the activity for the duration of their stay. This will be calculated automatically based on the information you provide. You need to click on the add cost of living button to get the following pop up box. First, you must enter the type of activity as well as details of the destination country and duration of mobility the total number of learners, and then separately, how many of those learners are classified as SEND or disadvantaged, if any. Please also include the number of accompanying safeguarding staff here or enter zero if there are none. Once you've entered this information, this will populate the cost of living table, which you can see at the top of the next slide. You're able to add additional costs by clicking the button in the cost of living table. These costs include additional educational needs support for SEND students and costs to cover exceptional travel. The travel section at the bottom of the page is populated once you click on the add travel button within the cost of living table. It calculates the cost of any travel as part of the activity once you've entered participant and distance information. You can gather information on distances from the programme guide. Next is the organisational support section, which calculates the funding total for your project and is allocated at a fixed sum per participant. First of all, you'll need to enter your anticipated point of expenditure, which will be used to trigger the payment of your organisational support budget. You'll also need to provide an overview of the types of expense organisational support will go to. This refers to any costs directly linked to the implementation of the project. The further two sections within activities on the left hand side are activity summary and budget summary, which you need to carefully check before moving on to the next section. Both will automatically populate based on the information you've provided in this activity section. Now the project plan. This section gives you the opportunity to provide a detailed description of your project activities the information you include in this section will automatically generate your project plan. This will provide you with a schedule for your project, including points for requesting payments and your activity start and end dates. Please ensure you double check this section thoroughly, paying particular attention to the anticipated points of expenditure. The final section is the privacy notice, which you can see um, on the bottom left. Um, you must ensure you read this. It gives a detailed explanation of how we'll use the information you've provided in the form. Once you've read this section and if you agree with its content, please select the I confirm that I agree to this privacy policy box. Please note you'll need to complete this section before you can view either the declaration or summary pages. The declaration is automatically generated once you agree to the privacy policy. You need to ensure you read the declaration thoroughly, declare what type of organisation you represent is and sign electronically, which you can see on screen now. Once signed, you can see the project summary and submit the application. You'll only be able to submit once each, each section is completed. If there is a cross against any of the sections, it means you must go back to rectify a mistake or input something into an empty required field. Hit submit application once you're finished and you'll receive an automated confirmation email of receipt. So that's the end of the application form run through.